Lauren and I have a friend named Stephanie, and Stephanie is this wonderfully, beautifully vibrant woman. She is a little bit older than us, and we met her in a previous church, and they were our life group leaders, her and her husband. And their testimony, their testimony is really, really mind-blowing because the husband, he was supposed to go to jail for about 10 years and somehow miraculously got off without having to do any jail time. And it was, it was really amazing. And then his wife grew up in a very broken home situation in which her mom basically just gave her away, gave her and her brother away, uh, kind of, you know, quasi having a friendship relationship with her as time went on, but she more or less was kind of passed around in the foster care system. She actually ended up being trafficked and um, traded for a horse. Yeah, so there's a family who said, give, yeah, give us this girl, Stephanie, and we'll give you a horse. And so that happened. And then the state was like, what the heck? Like, where is Stephanie? And so she had a very, yeah, she was, she was raped. She was uh, severely abused all throughout her childhood. And it was very, very tragic. She said that one day she was out in the farm or something. And as she was sitting down, she was startled looking at her leg, which looked like there was a very ornate imprint of a, of a big giant wing on her leg. And so she thought maybe it was like an angel had just like touched her. And she thought it was the freakiest thing. She said she didn't have a, you know, a, a means to take a picture of it at the time. But even in the midst of her abuse, she took that as God was getting her attention. And so sometimes she would get on the bus to a Baptist church and she would hear about God in that way. But for the most part, she had a very jacked up um, upbringing, enormous amount of abandonment, abuse, neglect, and, uh, and things of that nature. And when you see her today, if you were to see her, you would not think anything was wrong with her. You would think she grew up in this perfectly pristine family who loved and adored her. And you, you, would, you, would, you would imagine that her childhood probably was so amazing because her parents were so amazing because look how well she turned out. You would have like no idea that her past was a train wreck as the term that she used. And what's so cool is that you, when, you, when you see someone like her and how God could take such an enormously terrible jacked up childhood and transform her into the woman she is today, that's an incredible encouragement because you think, oh my gosh, God could do that literally with anyone. Anyone God can do that with. And it really just comes down to, one, our willingness to embrace the pains of the past. Are we, or do we have enough courage to embrace those things and see them for what they are and get help from them? And the right kind of help, right? I think she was able through prayer and the care of a church who patiently walked with her, she got to that place. And I, I believe very sincerely that any person, no matter their family of origin, can be healed and delivered and set free from the toxicity of their past. And now she has a beautiful family today. So we are not um, so far gone that God is unable to help each one of us. But the question is whether one, you know, we're going to, be okay with growing in our self-awareness of the, the habits of our, of our families of origin. We're also going to surrender to God and, and allow him to help us because we, these are things we can't do on our own. And also, um, yeah, uh, supernaturally, I think, by the power of Jesus to, to help mend us. Yeah, as Isaiah 61 talks about that, Jesus has the Messiah will come, and he will come for the brokenhearted. You know, he will bind up their wounds. And so Jesus is intending, I think, for each one of his children that kind of restoration. I don't think God promises physical healing for all of his children, but I do think 
with regards to the soul, the, the well-being of the, the emotions and the restoration of the mind, I believe that is the will of God for us to be restored. Um, we're going to get new bodies one day, and God can and, and has restored bodies before, but I, I believe sincerely that when Jesus says he's come to make our joy complete, I think he means it. I think he means that we can have joy and we can also live a life of fullness to glorify God that um, will we'll put aside the, the things we learned in the past. So we're going to look at the probably the most toxic family in the Bible, and we can find it in Genesis 31. So let's turn to Genesis, oh, sorry, Genesis 37, Genesis 37, and we're going to talk about Toxicity like you cannot imagine. Now, you may have read this story a number of times, as I have, but I want you to really embrace the details of how toxic this family is. When we, when we read it, we kind of gloss over some of it, like, oh, yeah, I've heard that story before, and, you know, Joseph went down to Egypt, and blah, 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 right? But, but let's actually look how incredibly toxic <laughs> this family dynamic is. So Genesis 37, verse 1, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, wives, plural, uh-oh, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. Not for anyone else, but just for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Okay, so, so far, we have some recipe for disaster brewing as Joseph is the youngest kid, apart from his other brother, Benjamin. But uh, Joseph is the youngest amongst his brothers. And um, yeah, or, or he has a lot of older brothers, we'll put it that way. And, and they are very, very angry at Joseph because Jacob loves him the most. And he loves Joseph the most because of his mom. And Jacob had a couple wives, which is never a good idea. And some people say, well, you know, the, the Bible has polygamy and therefore, you know, this is, you know, not worth following because it has polygamy in it. And whenever polygamy is described, it always talks about the negative things that happen as a result of it. <laughs> so it's not condoning it. And Joseph is the favorite, and it's because Rachel was Jacob's favorite lady. Jacob had four, and Rachel was the favorite, and Joseph is the favorite son. So this is just very unpleasant because Jacob, we don't really know why, but decides to make a very nice robe, a supreme Gucci robe, whatever. It's very ornate and fancy and colorful, and it, it, it's very obvious to everyone how much favor Joseph has. Because the other brothers are like, we can see very clearly how much Jacob loves 
him over us. Where's my robe? And why does that have to be so ornate? And it's colorful. And it's, it, it, it's in such stark contrast to the rest of us. And for anyone who has experienced favoritism in the family, and not just perceived that way, but I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very clear favoritism. I mean, that, that's an incredibly painful experience. And so it says they hated him. They hated him so much that they couldn't even speak a kind word to him. You, you know we, you hate someone when you can't even say anything nice to them. So they all hate his guts. And then what, what's very fascinating, though, about this passage is that God gives him these prophetic dreams. God gives him these, in, the, in these moments of him being hated by his brothers, God actually gives him these prophetic dreams. And the, the timing is interesting because God didn't have to give it to them at the, uh, give it to him at this time. He could have done it before, could have done it later, but it's right in the midst of, after the fact, Jacob gave him this really beautiful robe and his brothers already hate him. And then Joseph's going to say, y'all are going to bow down to me. <laughs> and everyone just thinks he's a narcissist. Like he's the favorite son, he's young, he is 17, and now he's saying he's going to rule and reign over us, even though he's not the oldest son. And they just, they can't stand this guy. Because it says in verse 5, they hated him all the more. So they really despise him. They, they can't take it. They feel the pain of being rejected by their father in favor of him. And they hate his guts. There's a lot of dysfunction happening in this, needless to say. And Joseph unwisely shares this prophetic dream with his family. He could have kept that to himself. But he, he decides to share it unwisely, which will lead to what's going to happen next. So turn to verse 12, and we'll keep going. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring back word to me. Then he sent him off to the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for your brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. So they're not where they originally were supposed to be. They're actually at a distance. So they're, they're very far away from accountability for a plot to harm Joseph. And it said they plotted to kill him. That's, that's their intent. They actually want to murder their own son. In 19, here we go. Here comes the mockery, the sarcasm. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben, who's the oldest, heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see where, whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. 
Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. All right. Joseph finds himself in a very bad situation. He doesn't realize how much his brothers hate him. But he goes out into the wilderness, and his brothers all plot to kill him. The only one who seems to be on his side is Reuben. And he thinks, well, let's just throw him in this pit, but I'll, I'll take him back to dad, and we'll, that way he won't die. So they strip him of the, this ornate robe, which is symbolic of, of Jacob's favor for, for Joseph, and they throw him into this pit when their original intent was to murder him and then also cover it up and say that a, a wild animal ate him. So they think to themselves, well, okay, what's, what's the next best thing we can do since we kind of all agree, okay, he's flesh and blood, let's actually not kill him, but what's the next best thing that we can do next to actually murdering him? Oh, I know, let's traffic him. Let's traffic our little brother and give him to another country where he doesn't know any of the Egyptian language and he'll be completely alone and despairing and that way he'll feel the weight of rejection, how we feel. We feel rejected. Now he gets to feel the full weight of being rejected collectively. So his brothers are, they're not trying to murder Jacob, their own dad, but they're like, you know what, let's do something that's equivalent to that. Let's, let's basically reject his favorite son so that he will experience the pain of our rejection. So really the brothers, I mean, they, they do hate Joseph, but it's really just a reflection of their hatred for their father. And their father has rejected them, but I don't know how aware or self-aware Jacob actually is of his rejection of his sons. Jacob also grew up in a home in which he was rejected. He grew up in a home in which his father, Isaac, preferred the older son, Esau, and Jacob was the younger son. And Jacob was mom's favorite, and Esau was dad's favorite, and they had this feud and this whole drama with that. And this seems to be a trend in this family of a lot of nonsense happening. I like how in the book we've been using as a backdrop for, for this series, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, uh, Pete Scazzaro, he summarizes it this way. So he says, first off, there's, there are a couple big generational problems with this family, the Israelites, and it starts with this one family. But there's a pattern in each generation that happens. So the first pattern is lying. There's a lying problem in this family. A Abraham lied twice about Sarah. Isaac and Rebecca's marriage was characterized by lies. Jacob lied to almost everyone. His name literally means deceiver. Ten of Jacob's children lied about Joseph's death, faking a funeral and keeping a family secret more than ten years. Uh, there's also this other, other category, favoritism. Favoritism by at least one parent in each generation. Abraham favored Ishmael. Isaac favored Esau. Jacob favored Joseph and later Benjamin. The fourth category of toxicity is brothers experiencing a cutoff from one another in each generation. Isaac and Ishmael, Abraham's sons, were cut off from each other. Jacob fled his brother Esau and was completely cut off from years from him. Joseph was cut off from his ten brothers for more than a decade. And also, there's poor intimacy in the marriages of each generation. So Abraham had a child out of wedlock with Hagar. Isaac had a terrible relationship with Rebekah. And Jacob had two wives and two concubines. I don't know if you kind of think about it like this, but it actually gets worse it gets worse and worse and worse and worse as time goes on. It's not getting better and better and better and better. You would hope that at some point someone would say, you know what, mm, I think this is kind of toxic. And I think maybe let's try a different, you know, try to do something different because it seems like we're kind of making everyone else's lives more miserable, right? But that's kind of the nature of sin is, is it just keeps eating. It's like the mold growing on our wall in the bathroom that we keep trying to kill. And uh, apart from, 
from hacking away at the wall and starting over and replacing it, we're just like, yeah, I'll just like clean it, spray it down, and you know, it it doesn't really like get rid of the problem, you know. So in the same way, you can put band-aids on family trauma and rejection and pain and hurt and stuff like that, and uh, it's never going to get resolved. And actually, it's going to continue to get worse, which now it's really at its worst because they, they've, they've figuratively killed their brother. They figuratively killed them. But you could argue maybe it's even worse than murder because he's going to feel as if he's been murdered, but, but now he has to live the rest of his life in their minds in a hell He's going to be a slave. We don't know what's going to happen to him. We don't really care. We're just going to get some money from it. We're going to get 20 shekels like Judas just to give our brother away. And so they sold him. And it looks bad. So this is where God seems to step in very profoundly as Joseph continues to have a miserable time. But what's, what's interesting, and you can, you can actually turn to uh, Genesis 42. But let me just kind of summarize what happens in the meantime. This is Genesis 42, verse 1. Basically what happens is Joseph is in Egypt by himself. He knows no one. He has no family, no support system. He's just a slave. But God, along the way, gives him favor with Potiphar, his employer, and Potiphar's wife has the hots for him, and then she comes on to him, he stiff arms her basically, and then she says, he tried to rape me, and so they throw him in jail. And as he's in jail, he tries to be open to these other dream interpretations as the the cupbearer and the baker come, and it looks like he might get out of jail because of the favor God gives him in the dream interpretation, but then now he's still stuck in jail. So it just seems like nothing goes right for Joseph. He just keeps going farther and farther and farther into the pit, figuratively and also literally, like he was thrown into a cistern and and he's in jail. He just seems seems to keep going further and further down into this pit. And all throughout this time, he has an enormous amount of integrity. Now, obviously, when he's 17, he was unwise to share the prophetic dreams he had in the way he did. And that's arguably what led to the, you know, putting gasoline on the fire of his brother's fury. But all throughout this time, he has integrity and he doesn't cave and God honors him. And it it says throughout the narrative in the next couple chapters that God is with him. God is with him even in the midst of this. But what's going to be wild is in Genesis 42, when there's a famine. So Genesis 42 says, when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. So at this time, Joseph has been elevated to the right-hand man uh, next to Pharaoh. Joseph is the second most powerful person in the country, which is the greatest country at the, in the world at that time. He's arguably the second most powerful person in the world. So verse four, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain for there was famine in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? He asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lived in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. So they think, 
Joseph said to them, it is just as I told you, you are spies, and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place until your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of, your, of you will be kept in prison so that your words will be tested to see if you're telling the truth. So I'm going to pause there. But basically what's happening is Joseph is taking out his anger <laughs> on his brothers. He's speaking harshly to them. He has all the power. He actually has the power right now to put them in prison. Which he does. <laughs> she puts them in prison. You guys are going to be in prison, and we're going to make sure we get Benjamin back here. And so now Benjamin's the favorite. He's been the favorite for the last decade. Jacob's not going to be excited about the idea of Benjamin going, right? And so Joseph is coming to the reality of how much pain he still has. He is coming face to face with the reality that he is still angry that he has experienced abandonment and rejection and contempt and scorn. And so much so that Joseph, I'm sure, realizes they might, they should have just killed me because that's essentially what they did is they committed murder in their heart. And so Joseph, in his reaction to them, he has all the power. He also has more, more power because they don't even know it's him. He has all the power because he is more or less wearing a mask because of, you know, the the way in which he was dressed or, you know, the way his hair was or lack thereof. I don't know. I see bald people sometimes on hieroglyphs, so maybe he was bald. I don't really know how that worked. Sometimes they wear mascara, too, or painted eyes, and so we don't really know. They haven't seen Joseph in a long time, but for whatever reason, Joseph really notices them, who they are. And so Joseph can understand their language, and Joseph knows who they are, but they don't know him. Joseph has all the power. Everything is in his court. The the power's been flipped right now. So for the first time, Joseph can determine their life or death, and you can see the wrestling he has. He's speaking harshly with them, and now he's going to play games with them. Because he's... When people are on the receiving end of toxicity, the venom is still in you. There's venom still in Joseph. And he's going to screw with them. And he's going to have Benjamin. He's going to put this, this goblet in his sack of grain. And they're going to find it. And they're going to freak out because now it looks like they stole stuff. And Joseph's just wargaming and manipulating and scheming. And he's taking his venom out on them. Just like how he was manipulated and tormented. And, um, you know, at the end of it, though, it's, it's, you look at, look at actually verse 24. If you, if you look at verse, or chapter 42, sorry, verse 24, there's, there's a little bit more interaction that we're not going to look at right now. But in verse 24, it says, he turned away from them and began to weep, but then came back and spoke to them again. So Joseph has been carrying the weight of his grief for so many years. And for someone like myself, who's done pastoral ministry and worked with many people, you'd be astonished at how many people, even in the church, still carry their grief with them. And they just manage it. And I really believe God's heart is for his church to be healed and restored and to have surgery done and to be in physical therapy, and to get better. That's actually God's heart, I think, for his church. But see, what happens is, when we don't deal with this stuff, it, it comes back to us in some way. I mean, just in, 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 in the way that Joseph came face-to-face with his trauma, you may not come face-to-face with the people who caused your trauma a while ago, but you will come face-to-face with the effects of it. And you'll see the effects of it in your marriage, in your parenting, and it'll scare you. And you're like, I am just like my parents. Or I'm just like how my family dynamics were. I thought I dealt with this. And God's heart is for us to be emotionally healthy because God loves us. 
There's this really cool quote also in this book. It's um, towards the end of this section, but he makes a really good point. He says, unhealed wounds open us up to habitual sin against God and others. Unhealed wounds open us up to habitual sin against God and others. One of the biggest questions I've encountered in the church, people ask, I have habitual sin. I don't know what to do with it. So they'll say, I keep struggling with pornography. I have no idea what to do with it. And alcoholism or whatever it is, you know, they, they have like habitual things they just can't stop doing. And so the Christian conversation usually is something like, well, you know, you just need to pray harder. You just need to repent a little bit more and say you're sorry more. You need to just tell a few more people about what you're going through and, uh, and you'll be fine. If you have a gunshot wound, it, it helps when you tell other people that you have a gunshot wound, like you tell the 911 9 or the ambulance people, I'm, I have a gunshot wound <laughs> in my arm. Oh, okay, cool, thank you for telling us. We'll go help you now. You know, it's nice to tell people, it's nice to be aware that you've been shot in the arm, have that self-awareness. Oh, I, I think I've been shot. I think I have a gunshot wound. <laughs> it appears I'm bleeding a little bit, more than I thought. It's nice to have self-awareness. It's nice to realize, hmm, you know, I think, I think I need to plug it up a little bit. I'm going to plug up this gunshot wound a little bit, you know, put a little stuffing in there and wrap it up. And uh, I think I need to tell people about it. Okay, that's a lot of times in the church how we sort of treat these things. I, I noticed I've been shot. I plugged it up a little bit, and I told someone that I have it. But we actually need to, like, remove the bullet. We need to... Maybe do a little bit of surgery if we need. And then let's do some physical therapy after. And then eventually, you're going to have your arm back. It's really cool. But this is not something to behaviorally mod modify. What you end up having in the, in the church is a lot of people, they have gunshot wounds, severe trauma. Uh, and, and, and how we're defining trauma is experiencing such a, a, a negatively harmful experience alone. That's the definition of trauma is, is you feel like I'm experiencing this, but I have no compassionate witness to be there with me. So when it comes to these wounds, these are perfect breeding grounds for infection. And that is how habitual sin happens. It's these, these deep wounds that we don't deal with, and Satan puts his little hooks in it, and uses it as a means by which to lie to us, uh, to intensify the temptations of sin. And, um, and it leads to people being very dejected, and they sometimes even lose assurance of their salvation. They're like, I keep struggling with this sin, and I don't know how to get this venom out of me, right? But God's solution for this is, yes, it's, it's important to have self-awareness. It's important to... Uh, Stop the bleeding, if you will. It's important to tell someone, um, but it's also important to allow Jesus to be your healer. And what I mean by that is so many times as Christians, we try to be our healer. We try to put up our own walls. We try to do our own exercises to try to get past our trauma and woundedness. We try um, even to become bitter because that helps us feel justified in our anger, which actually just poisons us more. But Joseph's weeping is, is very painful, and he has felt alone, but he has still experienced God with him. The question is, how did Jesus handle this? Because Jesus grew up in a home that rejected him, and they thought he was crazy, and they did not initially believe him to be the Son of God. I mean, uh, Mary definitely, Mary and, and uh, Joseph definitely had a miraculous experience to the point where they're certain that he is the Son of God. But um, J Jesus is very familiar with sorrow. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, the Messiah is, is going to be despised and rejected and a man of sorrows. So how is it that Jesus 
being a man of sorrows and experiencing every weakness and temptation as we've experienced, how did he end up being so healthy? How did he end up being the healthiest person ever? And it's because he didn't allow the curses of other people, the wounding of other people to alter his identity. He didn't allow it to alter his knowledge of the love that the father had for him. And he didn't allow it to cause unforgiveness in his heart and an attitude of bitterness to the point where Jesus is being killed and crucified because Joseph wasn't killed, but Jesus actually was killed. Joseph had his, his robes removed and Joseph was rejected by the, you know, the, the people that he cared about. Jesus comes to his own people. They don't recognize him. They strip him of his robes and Jesus dies for his Jewish brothers, the people you know, that, that are putting him to death, and he dies for the whole world who is, who is against him. And yet, even in all that, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he did that because he didn't allow the venom to affect him. Because the snakes were biting Jesus, but the venom didn't find a way into his veins. And I think the reason why that is is because Jesus didn't stay in that woundedness, but he, Jesus, I, I'm, I, I imagine the, the quickest person to forgive people and in his heart to love and move on because love covers a multitude of sins. So Jesus being the most loving person, Jesus being the most secure person, he never let the venom affect him. And... And for, for each of us, with our families of origin, we have a lot of things that maybe we need to unlearn or, or work through. But we, we are reminded that, that we have someone who understands what we've gone through. A lot of people bring up certain criticisms of the He Gets Us campaign, campaign and I understand you know, a bit of the criticism, but these commercials you may see at sporting events on TV or whatever. The, the, the point is, I think what they're trying to get at is you actually have someone out there, his name is Jesus, and he understands what you've gone through. He knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to be abused and mistreated. He knows what it's like to be slandered. And because of that, we have someone who really gets us. We have someone who really loves us and embraces us and, and, and can know us even when you feel like no one else does. And I appreciate at least that, that notion that we have someone who gets us. And Jesus binds us up and, and heals our gunshot wounds by, by showing that he was actually there in those moments. And when we, when we also recognize his heart, when, when, people, you know, when, when we're mistreated, when we recognize how he feels about that, when we recognize how for us he is, that is incredibly healing. Because I think that's where people lose their faith is they, they have these experiences and they want to blame God. They think, God, well, this happened, so obviously you don't care. This happened, you obviously don't want to punish them or you don't want to whatever. But if people really saw Jesus' heart for them as they experienced those traumas, they wouldn't have that attitude towards God. They would say, oh, wow, he's really for me and he really hated what happened to me. He hated seeing the toxicity of my family, and he, he desperately wants to fix it and redeem it. And what's crazy, though, at the end is Joseph actually does embrace. He hugs and kisses his brothers after all this. He says, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And so he has this mindset where he recognizes God's in control. God loves me. God, God has been for me. And even though I've been mistreated by human beings, my own flesh and blood, God was for me. And with, with, because of the love and support that God gave him, he was able to let that pour out onto his brothers who didn't deserve it. And when we are, when we are moved by the love of God and, and embraced by a very compassionate and merciful Savior, that gives us the power and ability to forgive people, and that cuts off the source of venom and allows us to eventually depleted out of our system. Yeah.
but we have to go through dialysis. Dialysis? I don't know. I'm trying to think of other medical terms about like whatever cycles out your blood and cleans it. Is that dialysis? Is it? Okay, praise God. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I didn't know. I don't know much about it. Okay. So, but that, that is the work of the Holy Spirit in, in cleansing us from these things. So let's be open to how he wants to bring restoration to our lives. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are the one who gives us self-awareness over the habits we've learned. Lord, I thank you that you teach us new things in your word, and you also give us power by the Holy Spirit to live those things out. So help us, God, as we try to start new chapters in our lives. We're grateful for the families you gave us, God, and I pray that you'd help us to own our venom I pray you help us to own our contribution, our own folly. And I pray that we would turn from these things. And I pray, God, that as a church family, that Epicenter would be the healing community that people are looking for. I pray that people would be healed and restored and redeemed. And that this would be the church family that is restorative for people's lives. I pray that just in the way our body restores itself when there's damaged parts. I pray that our church would be restorative to other people and bring healing and life and flourishing by your Holy Spirit for your glory, Jesus. And pray this in your name, amen.